Okay, great. Um, hello, my name is Lara Zuber. I am a third year PhD candidate at the War Studies Department here, and I welcome you to this year's first New Voices Seminar on Extraordinary Story of Long Term Homicide Decline in Mexico in the 20th Century. So, those of you who are new to New Voices, uh, this series has been called to life to promote the research of PhD students and early career researchers working both within and beyond the School of Security Studies. And our speakers highlight diverse empirical, methodological, and theoretical approaches to understanding global security and engage with questions of equality, diversity, and inclusion within the discipline. New Voices has been successfully running for a couple of years now and is usually chaired by Dr. Amanda Chisholm, Senior Lecturer in Security Studies and Researcher in Gender and Security at King's College London. Because unfortunately she cannot be here today, I have the very special honor to chair the first year's, uh, the, this year's first New Voices seminar. I have the equally special honor to welcome presenter Raul Cepeda Hill and, discuss, and discussion Dr. Vinicius de Carvalho. Uh, Raul is a PhD candidate at the Defense Studies Department and the Graduate Teaching Assistant at the Department of Law Studies. Previously, he earned a master's degree in political science from El Colegio de, Me El Colegio de Mexico and a bachelor's degree in political science and public administration at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Currently working on youth and organized crime in Mexico, he has pub uh, published research on organized crime, foreign policy, uh, peacekeeping and Mexican politics. Dr. Vinicius de Carvalho is a Vice Dean International at the Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy at King's College London. Um, he has been, uh, he was the director of King's Brazil Institute between uh, 2020 and 22. And at the War Studies Department, he is convening the MA in Strategic Communications and teaches the undergraduate module on Latin American issues. Uh, in an extraordinary story of long-term homicide decline make in the 20th century, Raul explains the logics and developments behind, behind a long process of pacification in Mexico over the 20th century that came to an unfortunate ending in 2006. Raul will be presenting for about 20 to 25 minutes, and Vinicius will have around 10 minutes to discuss Raul's presentation, after which we will open up for a Q&A. So you, the audience, you're very welcome to write your questions in the Q&A section. Um, and uh, at any time of the presentation. So yes, without further ado, Raul, we are looking forward to your presentation on this exciting topic. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, and Dimitri both for being here in this in this seminar. I, I thank Amanda, she, I know she cannot be here, but she has been really nice to, uh, to present and invite me to new voices. And I think it's a really important space for PhD students to share the research. So what I'm going to present today uh, is, I'm going to start to share my screen. So one second. Uh, so you're seeing my Twitter feed promoting this, but now you can see basically this paper that has been published in the Journal of Crime and Justice that is the effects of long-term development in school expansion on the decline of homicide rates, 1950 to 2005. So super specific at any journal paper and academic research, but I will give you some context of this. So you can read the full paper because um, Gladly is open access. So you can, after this presentation, read the full text as, as Vinicius has done. So if you have further questions, obviously you can send me an email or read the paper. My email is in the paper and I'm going to share it at the last part of the presentation. So uh, this is the presentation. Uh, everyone can see it uh, if, if you can. Uh, Laura Vinicius. Yes, great. So um, with this, uh, I'm going to tell you like the how the how the topic began to be made for, by me and my colleague that is Carlos Pérez Ricard. Carlos, when I when we began this project, he was a postdoc in Oxford University in the Latin American Center of Studies, and uh, now he's a professor in CIDE, that is a high in social sciences research center in, in Mexico. 
So he's now a he is now part of that faculty. Graph that I'm going to show you next. But in that moment, one of the discussions that we, that we were having is how to explain uh, is everything right? Sorry, Raul. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we are seeing yeah. still the, the web page of the article, not the presentation. Oh, okay. Is that that's, correct? Or? Yeah, okay. That's that's good to tell me. So I'm going to, oh. yeah, I'm going to reach her again. Uh, it must, uh, yeah, now you can see the presentation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Uh, things that happened. Okay, so basically Carlos and I, uh, my colleague, we were in a seminar and we saw the next graph I'm going to present and we had no explanation for this graph. We have some intuitions about this graph and it's going to surprise the people that are not aware of the Mexican case and I will make you the context of this. Uh, I know that popular presentations of Mexico show us a violent country but I'm going to present you two different stories at the same time that is interesting. So basically, this was a trip that I and Carlos made to explain the graph. So uh, can everyone see the graph? Great. So uh, this is a graph of the homicide rates per 100,000 inhabitants in Mexico during the 20th century. Usually we measure homicide rates by 100,000 inhabitants so we can compare it over time. Basically, the population in Mexico was smaller back in the 20th century and has increased. But as you can see, from 1926 to at least 27, homicide rates in Mexico sharply declined. Um, but those homicide rates increased after 2007. These are the two main sources that show us this decline. First is a database that I use for this paper. That is what Pablo Picato, uh, Sara Hidalgo, and Andres Lachus made in Columbia University. They basically gathered the information of homicide rates in judicial records, and they made a database. The other line, like that's the dark red line. The light, the light red line is the official homicide statistics in Mexico. Um, they might see different because they are registering the same phenomenon from two different sources, but they coincide at least in the tendency that Mexico was experiencing a sharp decline in homicide rates during the 20th century. And in 2007, those homicide rates increased again. Why? Because the president of Mexico during that term, Felipe Calderón, um, deployed the army against drug cartels in Mexico, and drug cartels responded to that deployment violently. And since then, we have seen really high homicide rates in Mexico. Um, even if that, Mexico had even higher homicide rates, according to the data that Pablo Picato, Sara Hidalgo, and Andres Ochoz gathered these years, that is Statisticas del Crimen in Mexico, and there's a source in, in, in the presentation slide, and uh, Mexico used to be really violent and it became really peaceful during the 20th century. There's many explanations of why homicide rates in Mexico increased since 2007. Uh, but it was my interest to explain that because basically everyone in Mexico and other parts of the US and the UK have explained that graph, the second part of the graph. My interest was to explain the first part of the graph that is the dark red line. So it's really interesting. Nine, in 1926, it's basically when the Mexican Revolution finished. So that's a context you need to know. Mexico was living in a really deadly conflict. That was the Mexican Revolution, really famous one. And by this point, Mexican authorities were beginning to establish a new form of government that, if you know about Mexico, was a one-party state system. And uh, the PRI, PRI, we call it Mexico, uh, dominated politics since then. So, well, the formation of the PRI was later, but people know that know the historiography of Mexico know about this. I'm not going to draw you into political details. So, 
this is the graph uh, without the data from 2007, so you don't get too confused. So they gathered this really important database. They basically went to the official records of the attorney general offices in the 32 Mexican states. Mexico is a federation, so we have 32 states, and they made this number. So basically it's a sharp decline uh, from 40 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants to less than 10. So quite, quite a remarkable process. This paper is about this process. Um, some Latin American context. These homicide declined happened uh, while all Latin America since the 80s has experienced high rates of violence. So you can see several countries there, uh, Colombia, Brazil, Costa Rica, El Salvador, and Guatemala. And as you can see, several of them suffer really, really steep increases on, on violence since the 80s. It's some really gruesome, like the case of Colombia that almost reached 100 homicide per 100,000 inhabitants rate, homicide rate, basically was the war against FARC and the war against organized crime there. You can see El Salvador that was basically organized crime after the peace process in, in that region. In Guatemala, homicide rates declined after the end of the civil war in the 1980s. And in Costa Rica has seen a spike on homicide rates. And the case of Brazil, we know that Liz is a country that has experienced long violence with, well, drug cartels, but also gangs in certain cities of, of, of Brazil. So Mexico, as you see the red, uh, the green line um, with, with triangles, basically what had lower uh, homicide rates than anyone else. And it began to increase again in 2007. So Mexico was going in a path really different from La for the rest of Latin America. So what this homicide rate uh, data show us, uh, this graph is the, for other crimes. So Picato, La Juz, and Hidalgo uh, also gather data on other crimes. So you can see basically that homicide declined even if injury rates, property damage, and robbery increased after the 80s. Th that's not coincidence that violence in other countries in Latin America and robbery in Mexico increased in the 80s. Basically is, if someone is aware of Latin American history, is the increase of inequality and the economic crisis in the 80s, the debt crisis that several countries in Latin America suffered. And in Mexico in particular, in 1994, we had a really big economic crisis. You can find it on Wikipedia as the tequila crisis. <laughs> so that transmitted to all the region. So um, eventually, Argentina had a currency crisis and Brazil had some effects, not as much because Brazil is more closed economy than the other liberalized economies in Latin America. But basically, uh, even if crime rates increased, homicide rates did not increase. And that shares the question of why this happened, why economic trends by itself do not explain um, the decline of homicides. So, which are the main drivers of this homicide decline? So literature goes to many places. If you read people that does uh, conflict, violence, crime from different sources, conflict, criminology, sociology, international relations, political science, uh, there are some kind of important explanations. First, the legacies of the Mexican revolution. So most literature in civil war says that after war, new peaceful, uh, new peaceful agreements come after place. So basically state, the state increases its forces because one of the leads of the civil war wins and they just rule the country and they establish um, a new order of things and they can use force to implement that order. Um, so this literature is, really, is remarkable. For example, the case of Guatemala, as you saw in the graph about Latin America, or for example, the case of Japan. If you see the case of Japan, that is one of the countries with the lowest homicide rates in the world, basically the steep decline in homicide rates in Japan is due to the end of the Second World War. So you will see a steep decline in homicides or violence after wars, 
civil wars or interstate wars. Basically, not all countries can keep up having violent conflicts forever. Second is luring long to drivers of, conf of, of conflict, so pacification. Manuel Eisner and other authors um, taken from the civilizational theory of, of other sociologists has found that some cultural changes have, dri have driven the decline of homicide in the world. In the case of Europe, for example, the adoption of, of the decline of honor culture and the centralization of governments afterwards. So 13th century, 14th century, 15th century, Europe saw really deadly balance between countries. We have the classic wars that we know in Europe, but also the decline of some forms of interpersonal violence that happened. There's a, I, I quote, I cite a paper that is really interesting one that is, it was common in Kent, in, in England, in the 13th century that people were into duels and they killed each other in duels. So basically you find someone, you disagree on something, for example, property or honor. So they honor killings happen. So basically they found each other in the middle of the street and they shoot each other or they use swords, etc. So this kind of homicide that is basically to duels and other kinds of interpersonal violence declined in, in Europe in the 20th century. Other kind of, uh, of theory that has come across is that education can drive down violence by transmitting values um, of peaceful, ways of, of dealing with, with complex. The other is economic growth uh, and the reduction of inequality and poverty can drive also to the decline of homicides. Basically, that there are some economic drivers of violence because people are getting into violent crime to, to make ends meet. So basically, it's, it's a way of labor. And finally, Alberto San Kaplan for the case of Colombia uh, say that land reform, basically distributing land, prevents counterinsurgency. Many guerrillas in Latin America searched because land wasn't distributed between the farm um, or the peasant class, and the elites in these countries were landowners. And they say this for the case of, of Colombia and Peru, uh, but all Latin America had really large shares of population of landowners. So these large populations of landowners were part of the motivations of revolutions in the 20th century. In, and in Mexico, what happens is that after the Mexican revolution, uh, we draft a new constitution that allow what we call the, the biggest land reform in history of Mexico. So basically we distributed all the land to the peasants after, and we abolished uh, most of the private property of land. Um, this happened since the 1930s until 1997, when the government allowed farmers to sell their land. Basically, we collectivized land, like in the Soviet Union. Yes, inspired in the Soviet Union. We had a president that was an admirer of the Soviet Union, that was Lazaro Cárdenas from 1934. So, with all this in mind, uh, what I did in the paper was using the database I told you so, and I read all the theories behind the reduction of violence and I tested these variables. You can see them. An increase of unemployment reductions could reduce uh, homicides, increase in schooling can reduce homicides, increase in youth culture, so pressure, demographic pressure of having lots of youth without employment can increase violence. Economic growth can increase violence because basically there's more opportunities for crime. That's rational theory. Uh, economics of crime, uh, theories in, in sociology and economics, urbanization can increase violence because there's social disorganization, family controls, family can, that cannot control their youth, usually the youth are going to commit crimes, this comes from uh, sociology, land reform can reduce uh, homicides, democratization can increase violence because it expands, basically what theory says that democracy can expand opportunities for crime because there are many openings for organized crime to inflict in government policy and more crime opportunity. So one crime can allow you to commit another crime and an increase in punitive authority. So basically police forces, state, 
can reduce crime. So I tested all these theories, all these theories are reviewed uh, and you can read about them. It's tons of many fields and subjects. So I want you to understand the Mexico 20th century. I have said something, some things about it, but I'm going to share a bit more of it that is really interesting about how Latin America, but in particular Mexico, close to the US developed in the 20th century. And you will understand my results. My results are really um, directly linked to this. First, Mexico is huge in terms of population. We passed from 40 million people to at least 129 million people in 2020. The last census says that we are 129 million Mexico, not because I was in census, because I was here in London, but it's a huge country. We are one of the most populated countries, obviously in the table of the at least 15 most populated countries in the world. In Latin America, the only country that beats us in population is, is Brazil. And in America, just in the continent, just the US that has 300 million and Brazil was has 200 million. So we're a huge country. So feed all these people is a government's challenge. Urban population. So not only population increase, so also the number of, of the population that lives inside cities. 80% of the population in Mexico now lives in a city and not in the not in a rural area. So that changes, that shows a lot of how Mexico changed during the 20th century. This was be, because we have an extensive growth period after the Mexican Revolution. In literature about Latin American economy, you can see it, and in Mexican history, we call this. Uh, the Mexican miracle, the Milagro Mexicano. It's, it's done as these imaginary names, but basically saying that the module of production, the commodities at the time, and the, adapt and the adaptation of Mexico, the global economy after the Second World produced this. We had increases in 12% rates some years, and it was steadily 7% growth until the 80s. When, as I told you, we had economic crisis to face, uh, then is when economic uh, expansion stopped. But these like years, at least 20, 40 years, no, the 20 to 30 years of steep economic um, growth were really important. That basically meant that GDP per capita, I know it's not the best indicator of poverty or inequality because there are many issues with this measurement and you can have, you can read those discussions, but at least we can see that the increase was exponential. So basically the economic growth in Mexico benefited at some way, in some ways to most of the population in the 20th century. And this also happens with life expectancy from 50 years to 74 years life expectancy rate increase. This is due not only to the increase of uh, birth, but also because of the expansion of the health services in Mexico. Even fragmented, at least you can find a clinic in, in, in some of the rural areas in Mexico and in most of Mexican cities. Even if we have uh, like the decline of like the increase of birth was paired with a decline of of birth rates, but it's still high for comparative in, in, in Europe. Just to give you an example out of hand, in, in, on average, a European nation now, uh, mostly Western Europe, is one kid per woman in family. In Mexico, it's 347 in 1990. So that tells you that every family was having four kids, five kids. So we had a large, large number of young men in Mexico that still fits into the Mexican economy and they're part of the working force. So I'm going to show you those, these population pyramids. Basically, we had a lot of young men uh, that were uh, in 1980s. Now that's declining, Mexico is now looking more like an industrialized country with a steep decline in birth rates. Basically, women are deciding to have less children and they're having two in 
in, in, on average, and there were, we were going to have a population problem later, like any other European country is going to have. But at least in 1980, you can see that we have a long number of young men basically uh, needed for school, employment, um, so forth and so forth. So Mexican, uh, Mexico developed a lot during the 20th century. And we increased schooling years. One of the, um, of the country's big successes in establishing uh, central government was universalizing schooling. We increased schooling rates from less than a year to nine years of schooling. On average in Europe, for example, people that reach university reach to 15 years. What is nine years of schooling? In Mexico system is secondary school before high school. Uh, the comparative with the UK is like 10th year. Uh, so basically before going to university, at least people know how to read, how to write and do basic mathematical operations. Obviously this is an average. There are people are going to university, 34% of Mexican population go to university as myself. Uh, it's increasing, but at least we expanded uh, schooling rates. This graph is really important and you will see it later. So why did I do it with all this data? Um, as you can see, um, uh, I love data. First I did for the people that don't know statistics, don't worry basically is a panel data analysis. So I compared years and states. Mexico has 32 years, 32 states, and I compared eight decades. So this allowed me to have, to check the variances between regions and check the how during time these homicide rates decline. So I use what Picato, I don't wanna just use their database and originally wasn't complete. So what I did was a statistical trick that is called imputation. If you want to ask me about that, you can, you can ask me later because it's a long thing that involves um, population statistics that I am not interested to show you now, but if you ask me, I can show you later. And I collected all the historical data I could on the 20th century. So I checked all the censuses that were available and compatible, registers and estimations from mostly sources. So some data is not in the, data, in the database because it has not been produced. For example, one clear case is inequality. I don't have Gini index for, that is inequality is some, sometimes is measured by the Gini index. Um, and you can check that later. But basically I don't have those estimations. I cannot calculate them because that requires another mathematical process that is not my time. So I just use available data. So I calculated the average and you can see here. These are the two, 32 states in Mexico. And you can see that some states were pretty violent since the 20th century. Uh, since the beginning of 20th century, Tamaulipas, that's one of Sorry, I muted myself uh, for accident. Uh, Tamaulipas was really violent. Uh, Veracruz, Tabasco, Baja California, where Tijuana is. Um, Chihuahua, that is in the northern border of Mexico. Colima, that is in, in Midwestern Mexico. Hidalgo, that is central Mexico. But in general, you can see there that the tendency is the same. Each state had bigger or larger homicide rates at the beginning of the century and in every state decline. Obviously there are differences between them. So some have declined in the same pace, but they had higher rates before. So the decline was different, but basically the, the tendency was the same. So I compared from the decades from 1950 to 2005, because there's were available data. So if you want to be in which state I was born, I was born in the state of Mexico, a state that doesn't have any sense of its name, but I, I will make that joke another time. So uh, the Pena variable homicide rates with 100,000 inhabitants, 32 states. These are the years of study. You can see them. Census, agrarian reform data. So I also measure the land reform, judicial records, growth by states. So these are the sources, you can check them later. And I actually uploaded the database into my website. So the people that doesn't know about uh, how to read this table, 
because it's very econometric, econ econometric analysis. Don't worry, just care about the numbers that have stars besides. So the variables that have stars besides are the ones that have a statistical significance related to the decrease of homicide rates. And as you can see, there was just one variable of all the models that I made. Each model is a different mathematical specification on how to calculate these things. If you need more details about those, uh, you can send me an email, etc. The people that know econometrics from the public might know how to interpret these things and know the difference between these data and models. But basically, in all models, the each increase of each schooling year per decade reduced on average 24 uh, points into the homicide rate in Mexico. So it's impressive. There wasn't a model where this didn't have uh, effect. That's why the minus or a negative uh, signal in years of schooling. So basically the variable has had more effect calculating the probability of the decrease of homicide rates was increasing schooling. So pulling young people into schools. In the other models, you can see that some variables have meaning, uh, have some validity uh, in cavitans per home. That's how I measure urbanization and property damage rates. So basically, there were more young men going to school. There were seven, six young men into the same household in Latin America. There was some steep in crime increase that pushed a bit more homicide rates, but not that much because most of them were going to school. This graph shows you each triangle is each state and decade. So each state and decade. And we configure in this graph like schooling years and homicide rates. So when more schooling years are measured by state, there are less homicide rates. And this is a bivariate regression. Um, just concentrate in the red line uh, if you're an expert in, in econometrics. The red line is going down. Um, basically saying that by any increase of schooling years in Me by a Mexican state is declined by 25 on average. Um, so it's impressive. And when I saw this, this graph, I was impressed that this was the most important variable in my in my research. So uh, before going on, so what's the conclusion? Uh, getting kids into school reduces violence. How? Um, three ways. But I don't know how this happened. Why? Because this is aggregated numbers. So I don't know what actually happened in those years. I just know that they have a correlation, statistical one. The theories say basically three things. One, um, schooling gives young men opportunities for life. So if you give them formal opportunities in the formal economy that was growing up, as you saw steadily during the 20th century, giving them jobs and schooling, basically keep, took them away from violence and from violent crime. Second is a more routinistic way to see in schooling. You are keeping young men in schools for long hours. Basically, we know in literature about young men and violence, that is my thesis or my PhD thesis about young men violence in Mexico since 2007, that in this, Age, critical ages between 15 and 24 because it's your psychological transformation as, as an adult that you are having problems of what psychologists and criminologists call self-control. Basically, you are more prone to take risk, more prone to aggression, more prone to have um, a non-mature kind of personality to engage in crime. And if the opportunity comes to engage in crime, for example, if your peers uh, commit violent crimes. So keeping them into school basically moves them physically from committing crimes. And the third is the transmission of culture. A school transmits culture to people. 
peaceful cultures. But what kind of culture? Uh, I don't have the data of what kind of culture was transmitted to them. That's for historians to tell me. But my hypothesis is basically that these were cultures of obedience and authoritarian government. And Mexico was a one party system with an authoritarian government. And these authoritarian forms of politics and systems usually transmit authoritarian values through schools. And all, uh, I have read also recent research by other scholars that Chile, for example, in the 19th century, the dictators uh, after the civil wars in Chile pushed through the education system authoritarian values. How these authoritarian values go to school? Obedience to authority, obedience to the government, obedience to the police. So basically schools, families, and religion is telling you to obey your adults. So that has some consequences on peace, that is peace based on obedience. Which happened? Probably the three of them <laughs> at the same time, but I cannot assure what happened in those schools in the proven by historians later. Okay, limits uh, to cut this short first. I don't have data on state capacity of law enforcement at low levels. And that's unfortunate. I don't know how many policemen were in each of these states. So these results are could be better if I have that data. If education rates persist with new data, well, my my findings will be more useful in the future. I don't have historical data on inequality. I have on growth, you saw it in the table. There are some events of political violence that happened in 20th century Mexico that actually existed. Where, for example, um, okay, uh, for example, repression, political violence. We had guerrillas, uh, communist guerrillas. Uh, so there are many of the political violence in the 20th century that I don't have data. But my argument is that even with political violence, violence reduced. Uh, I don't have information about health services and health consumption of people in the 20th century. For example, homicide rates are highly correlated with alcohol consumption. Basically, people get drunk and get violent, and eventually they kill people. So I don't have to do that. And also, there's some data, uh, so dirty war, guerrillas, etc. in Mexico. Guerrero in the 70s, there's a region that we had a steep presence of, of guerrillas, communist guerrillas in Mexico that were eventually brutally repressed by the government in what we call the dirty war. That is also the Chilean case. So contributions, this is a starting point to discuss the history of violent crime in Mexico and Latin America. The evidence of the effect of school expansion can be tested in more settlings and comparisons with the other countries in Latin America and other places, like Latin America in that sense is not alien to other processes of, of development. And historical research provides evidence for peace building and violence reduction. That's one important thing. So this helps us to understand how we can develop development policies, in this case, opening schools to reduce violence in countries after in countries that experience deeply violent conflicts later. So basically it's that, many references, you can see them later and that's my email so that's my name and thank you very much okay great well uh thank you very much Joel. this was a very rich explanation of yeah the story behind the defining uh and yet little known characteristic of a significant part of Mexico's recent history. So um, yeah, to give enough time for Q&A, I will just right now uh, pass on to Vinicius for his discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. And thank you also, Raul, for your presentation and for the invitation to discuss your paper. It's a great honor for me. Um, I am very limited quantitatively speaking on methodologies to, to discuss uh, most of the, the elements, the fundamental elements of your text, but my, my comments will concentrate in some conceptual and, and probably uh, some, some traps that we can have in your text that I would like to provoke you to talk about then. Um, it is it's a very interesting work you have done looking about uh, looking around statistics from a quite long period and combining elements that 
could give you um, a good um, a good consolidation for arguments that you are putting there. No, um, well, first of all, um, some some issues on your paper that I would like to ask you if you could clarify better because. I sometimes was in doubt if you are discussing violence or homicides or taking them as synonymous, because sometimes you conclude about violence, but talking about homicides and discussing that as one is, is almost similar to the other. So that's one point that I would like to discuss here. The other one is you praise and use a lot the word pacification. This is a, is a terminology quite uh, often used in many Latin American countries. Uh, and it would be good to know what's the definition of pacification that you are using when you use this terminology. Because in Latin America, sometimes, and for many countries, the term pacification actually was used to justify state violence uh, against large parts of the population, included those that you are saying that uh, are beneficiaries of those public policies, like schooling. So it's so interesting when you quote uh, Eisner and uh, Norbert Elias um, and the, the, the element of strengthening of state control to reduce violence. Um, it's so curious because in many aspects of Latin America as well, the strength of state control actually was a strength of state violence. Of course, we in, in modern terms, we see and we understand that the, the, the state is the, has the monopoly of the over the violence. But the question is, when, when this monopoly turns into and against the, the population itself, and how can we measure if this state violence is actually not increasing, or sorry, this is a, a strengthening of the state, is actually not increasing, I will not say violence, but homicide rates or, or deaths. That's again my point here, because um, you you mentioned that tangentially, and you you are defending yourself very well that you are not getting into the political discussion about that. But how much of the social violence committed in the states um, uh, like Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, etc., also uh, cause a huge growing in violence even through schooling as well. So what's the difference between homicides and deaths in social confrontation? I would put like that. I think this data would be very interesting to bring as well. How, 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 much, how, data, how much data do we have about state violence or state uh, homicides or deaths provoked by the state? No? Um, another important element that I think uh, would be interesting to see more nuanced if you are thinking on develop this further is the comparison among states in Mexico. Um, a few years ago, I supervised a dissertation, a, a master dissertations by Manuel Solis Galeana um, here, and he was talking about the violence in the state of Guerrero in particular. And actually, what we saw is really a growing numbers of uh, homicides uh, year by year, despite schooling happening there. So it would be great to see how much this dialogue or among states don't... Um, don't represent uh, a counterpoint to the main argument uh, that you are uh, bringing in your paper. No, um, I love your optimistic approach uh, to towards um, towards society, and especially very optimistic about schooling. But again, we we have some papers, uh, and I quote one published by UNAM indeed: "School violence in Mexico: Explore its dimensions and consequences" by Jose del Tronco Paganelli and Abby Madrigal Ramirez. Um, and then there is an aspect also to, to think about that, how much schooling also don't reproduce social violence and actually um, come, make a sort of camouflage of this violence because it starts to happen within the walls of the schooling and students start to experiment violence, probably not homicides, but violence within the institution school. And that will be not, not uh, visible on the statistics clearly here. So I think looking ahead for continuation of your research would be very interesting to see as well this counterpoint, how much uh, schooling is also creating other sorts of violence or reproducing or perpetrating other sorts of violence that are not necessarily homicide. And I will not go further and longer in that, but just keep on these points that I think are fundamental for discussing this paper that actually taught me a lot and I learned a lot reading what you wrote. It's exactly, it's this clear definition of 
violence and homicide, how we correlate then, we should or not, what's the risk of correlating these two only. The second aspect is this concept of pacification, why we are using that and what we are considered pacification, which models of pacification are in terms here. And for many, as I said, many countries, pacification means exactly to, for instance, exterminate indigenous populations. So that's a, it's a process of state violence or institution violence as well. And the third one is this, this counterpoint of, um, of uh, violence, a schooling also being a sort of space for reproducing violence or uh, camouflage other sorts of violence as well. Um, I am afraid I cannot, as I said, discuss further the data and the findings due to my ignorance on, on quantitative methodolo methodologies, but I just want to congratulate you as well for, for this work that you have done until now. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Vinicius. Um, this is some very Im important comments on, on, on the foundations of the paper. And so um, actually, I think it, it would make sense now to, to pass it back to you, Raul, if you would like to comment on, uh, on Vinicius' discussion and then we can open up the Q&A. Thank you. No, no, I, I really appreciate this, this, these questions because they, these are also academic debates by themselves uh, that I understand. And obviously when one does, is crafting research, it's going to fall into these debates and has to defend itself, as you say, further. And, and I can see the Q&A, the two questions that are there, that basically go in the same line that Vinicius. So if you allow me, Laura, so we just go directly to the questions too. But I will address it simultaneously because I think they're, they're part of the same story about the paper. So the first is, I do one thing that Statis Calibas does in the logic of civil wars, in his seminal book that is basically saying, for us, for measuring conflict and violence, the proxy is homicides. It has indeed a problem that is conceptual, that is other kinds of violence that are not deaths. In these cases, implies, for example, torture and police violence, police abuse, uh, harassment, in meaning all these other ways that are not directly deadly violence made by the states are not necessarily measured. And this has some consequences, of course. That it's meaning that over states, the pacification process when the other kinds of violence happens. But I think that both are simultaneously. So you increase violence that is not deadly, so you can keep up the violence that was deadly. In some senses, and I will say from Mexican history, uh, I'm going to use an example of Mexican history. Now, if I'm not wrong, in 1928, uh, the presidential candidate, uh, Alvaro Obregón, want, wanted to run against, he wanted to run for a second term of president. If someone knows the Mexican Revolution, what's a revolution against re-election? And he was killed uh, months before taking office. Again. So you can use violence to pacify, exactly, you can do that. Like you can pacify by violent means. And that sends a signal to everyone in society that if more violence happens or more attempts to break out the rules of the previous violence established, uh, violence is going to happen and repression is going to come. Uh, that means essentially that those are the two heads of the same coin. You can pacify by violence or you can pacify by, in this case, social policy. What I say is that both happen in Mexico at the same time. You had uh, political violence happening, and there's a long historiography of the, that I said in the article. If someone is interested to read, like the, there's one book by Benjamin Smith that is called Dicta Blanda, that basically he's, she shows all these kinds of other kinds of state violence used, that in this case, torture, disappearances, menaces, um, kidnappings, um, abuse by police, and threats. These all forms of state violence was used basically to make that, for example, the generals that initiated revolts against the central government, because we had revolts against the central government since the Mexican Revolution, like continuously. Like there was a general that popped up every two years wanting to be president. 
and he was again beginning a rebellion. That explains the, the initial part of the graph. It's basically general rebelling against the state government, the central government, and the state usually use brutal violence against them. That's the case that used, for example, against Saturnino Cedillo and, and other generals. So that's one point. Uh, so I understand that methodologically, it's out of my scope, the forms of political violence that is not uh, And also like the, the forms of violence that is not physical, that I know the psychological violence and socioeconomic violence, marginalization that comes to that. So I know that, and that's a defect of the data and the method. So part of my argument is that homicide rates declined, but all the forces of violence happened. There's a recent book, actually the author of the, who gathered this database published a recent book about the, the history of the Historia Minima de la Valencia in Mexico, Minimum History of Violence in Mexico by El Colegio de Mexico. So you can go to El Colegio de Mexico and search for the book by Pablo Picato. And he makes the historiographic accounts of these other parts of violence. argument is that even if we have many types of violence, the country experience a decline on the deadly one very steep. So this can coexist. And this is the case of, of the dirty war in Guerrero, for example, that you can have many way, many forms of violence happening at the same time, but in overall the territory, the steep decline of homicide rates was so big that even these increases that could happen in Guerrero or in Michoacán, where there were rebellions by communist guerrillas, was not enough to reverse the decline of violence in the whole country. So that's interesting. So it's a case of the central government fighting against the localized rebellions. Uh, I'm reading uh, the question, so, so not to go from this and go to the other uh, other way to, to respond to your questions, that is, the homicide data between 26 and the excluded dates of political armed conflict include the Cristero Wars. And the answer is, we don't know, because these are judicial registries. And usually, and I cite Keith Krause, who usually studies basically counting deaths in conflict, perpetrators of violence try to hide their violence. So we don't know if these homicides represented the Cristero Wars homicide or not, probably. But in order to make that account, we would need to revise each and one of all the records of judicial system. And this hasn't been done. And obviously I could done it myself. I'm just a PhD student, don't like a database. But it's probable that this was a violence that, that David is, is talking about. But Cristero Wars were really deadly. Uh, and there's some accounts of Cristero Wars, homicide rates and violence in general against the Cristero Wars for the people that doesn't know. Um, basically the Mexican government is a liberal non-religious one and they repressed priests that were trying to escape from the regulation of the constitution. There is a very Jacobin constitution in Mexico since the 19th century. So the rebellious Catholic uh, guerrillas uh, by armed forces, and they were brutally repressed by the central government of Plutarco Elias Calles. So this is a John Mayer's book about the Cristero Wars. You can check it. Uh, but yeah, the data I have, I cannot compare also this period, 26 to 40, because I don't have censuses on that period. So the censuses are a thing that is regular from 1950. And I know that's a period I cannot explain with this paper. That's why it comes from 1950 to 2008. The second question is about disappearances. And this is a question that has been made by my reviewers a long time. And the question about disappearances is the same as that violent conflicts. We don't have systematic data on disappearances during the 20th century. So I would like to compare homicide rates and disappearances. Some people say that disappearances are the hidden number of homicides. The problem is I don't have disappearances numbers during the 20th century. Disappearances in Mexico were began to be recorded since 2000 uh, by the register of, of gone or disappeared people. That means essentially that that data in quantitative measure hasn't been recollected. If someone finds a way to have that data 
and having a database, the results of the paper could be different. Yes, I don't know. But that's that's the real answer. I don't know. But I cannot assume that I know at that, or that someone knows because nobody knows because we don't have the data. So that, that's the shortcomings of the data that we have uh, uh, available. Um, so I see the other, I understand the point that forms of balance can exist at the same time, but if you exclude broader political balance, you don't get fairly different impact of, but the point is, again, is that data codified? My problem is like, I concur that there are some forms of political violence. There's even violence derived from political violence. The thing is that it's not recorded in data. I would try and I try to find databases that could record these things and I think there's not available. And I would suggest to many people, uh, everyone that has funding, that they could recollect new databases about political violence in the 20th century uh, that could like basically close this gap. And maybe the paper would be different with this gap. And I say it explicitly in the paper. Uh, if, if this data appears, maybe a different result can come up. And, and that's normal, that's scientific research. Unfortunately, I don't have it. Uh, and the other thing, uh, I'll, well, I also addressed like different regional differences between balance. And lastly, about a, a balance in schools, bullying, etc. That's an interesting one. And I think that that might be also an explanation of, of longer pacification. That is basically that you transmit really authoritarian values that is respect to authority through schools. And also that schools not necessarily are peaceful places. There can be bullying, uh, there can be people beating each other. And basically when they get out of the school, maybe get into raw and fights. If you see the injury data, we might see that also there was an increase in injury data. So basically maybe people have, just to put it like a, a, an imaginary example. So uh, I'm seeing that uh, we have two minutes. So, uh, so to put an imaginary example, uh, kids get out of the school and there's a gang outside and they fight each other. So they began to fight each other, like a gang uh, fight that we know happens everywhere in the world. Um, but we have two things that explain why these uh, kind of violence outside schools didn't increase homicide rates. And it's the existence of health services. So when you have health services, you can avoid people dying from injuries. So I would like to have data on health services, for example, ambulance services and clinics to know if people are not killing each other outside the school in a gang fight. And the schools can be places to reproduce violence, yes. Um, and there's a historiography about, for example, the, the teacher's school in, in Guerrero, the same state that we were talking about. Uh, there's some teacher's school where there's discussion if they were being taught about uh, communist guerrilla warfare, uh, Mao teachings in some schools of, of, with communist backgrounds. And in other schools, people were taught that the communists were the red scares. Uh, so you can have, and I guess that was a bit of a harassment kind of uh, type of treatment of, of people in schools, uh, basically because there was a Cold War mentality during the 20th century. Uh, uh, and finally, according to your findings, uh, you can think that can be done in Mexico is this in our femicide rates rising closure of full-time schools. Okay, uh, just to give a context, uh, Mexico just closed uh, full-time schools uh, because of austerity cuts. Femicide has different uh, dynamics. And there are several papers on femicide dy dynamics. Schools can have an impact uh, in the sense of you closing schools so young people might, uh, youngsters that are not in schools might commit homicides against women. But most of the dynamic of homicides for women in literature is partner violence. So people that so if you take a homicide data during the 20th century, like afterwards, after 2007 shows that young men are killed in the street by gun violence. Most of young women in, in Mexico are killed by their partners without the gun. So the dynamics of femicides are different. I don't say that this doesn't have 
a schooling implication. I'm saying that might be different, but I cannot come up with a res full response right now. But yeah, the correlation might be different. So we have to say, for example, if these boys are, for example, leaving school and getting early girlfriends, and then like in some cases, gruesomely killing those girlfriends. So, uh, and that's a case of homicide and it's, it's a horrendous one. But that is also correlates for example, early pregnancy rates and all these kind of other dynamics that happens with uh, female violence. But yeah, I will leave it there because I know we are on time. Okay, wow. Um, what amazing um, audience engagement. I mean, what more can we wish for for the first uh, New Voices uh, uh, seminar this year? Um, Thank you so much, Raul, for, uh, for your presentation and uh, comments. And just to come full circle, um, Vinicius, if you have any final comments, um, advice, anything, um, then, yeah. Um, I would say, like, uh, my, short, my answers are short, but my email's there. I just want to congratulate you again for your work, Raul. Thank you. Perfect. Then thank you so much for everybody for being here. And uh, yeah, you have Raul's email, uh, the, the paper is open access. So yeah, thank you so much. And uh, see you. Have a lovely afternoon. Drop an email if you have some questions. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.